Welcome everybody. My name is Brian Cody, your digital disciple. Thanks for joining us on this beautiful morning. Came here to talk to you today about one of the, the last things I want to talk about as an introduction into to Christianity itself and to having a relationship with Jesus. And that's the fact that we are spirits. We are spirits living in a body. That's who you are and that's who God created you to be. And I know a lot of people feel like, man, this is just this right here. This is who I am. I'm going to live this life like this right here. And when this thing goes, boom, I'm done, bro. In the ground, everything, game over. But I'm here to tell you that you have a future in eternity. Your spirit that lives inside of you is actually who you are. And so today we're going to talk about that. And we're going to start in the garden, exactly where God created us. And I really want to go to this part right here just to just to get us started. I want to talk about this, what, what Jesus said and what he did. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's this. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. See, he breathed the breath of life into us. So we were formed the outside, our bodies. We were formed from the dust of the earth. But our life was breathed into us by God himself. So that's who you really, truly are. And we're going to talk about that today. Because just as your body will one day return from the earth that it came, your soul, your spirit will also return to the God from which it came. And that's what I want to talk about today. So let's get into that right now. All right, so let's pretend that you and I are having a conversation. And I ask you, who are you? Who sees when you see? Who hears when you hear? Now in Western civilization, if somebody walks up to you and says, who are you? You tell them your name. For example, Sally Smith. But I'm gonna challenge that answer by doing this. Writing down on a piece of paper, S-A-L-L-Y-S-M-I-T-H, and holding that paper up to you and saying, is this who you are? A collection of words? To which you're gonna respond, no, you're right. That's not who I am, that's just a title. That's just what people call me. Actually, I'm Frank Smith's wife. Well, that can't be right. That's not even politically correct anymore. If you're Frank Smith's wife, are you saying that before you marry Frank, you didn't exist? And if he died or remarried somebody else, that you would cease to exist? Once again, that's just another title that people call you. That's from experiences that you've had in your life, but that's not who you are. Now you say, okay, now you've got my attention. You're right. I'm not Frank Smith's wife. I was born in New York in 1965 to Harry and Mary Jones. We lived in New York till I was five years old where we moved to Newark, New Jersey, where I went to elementary school. I got all A's in school. And in the fifth grade, I played Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. I started dating my first boyfriend in the ninth grade and his name was Joe. Then I moved and we went to, I went to Rutgers College where I met Frank Smith and got married. And that's who I am to which I would respond, that's a fascinating story. <laughs> but that's not who you are. You just told me experiences that happened to you. But who had those experiences? Who was hearing and seeing through that time? Wouldn't you still be the same person if you went to a different college? And you realize, I don't think anyone's ever really asked me this question before. Who am I? Who hears when I hear? Who sees when I see? So now you respond, you're right. I'm the body that takes up this space right here. I'm five foot six and weigh 135 pounds. To which I would respond, but in the fifth grade, you were four foot six, not five foot six. So which is the real you? Is it the five foot six you? Or is it the four foot six you? Weren't you in there when you played Dorothy? You told me that you were. Wasn't it the same you that had the experience of playing Dorothy that is now having the experience of answering these questions? How about this? When you were 10 years old and you looked in the mirror, wasn't that a 10 year old you that you were seeing? But now, as an adult, when you look in the mirror, don't you see an adult in the mirror, the, the, the new you? But wasn't that the same person looking in the mirror the whole time? Wasn't that the same thing, the same existence? And you say to yourself, man, I think you're right. I've never really thought about this or contemplated this question before. So here's another thing. Let's do this as, an, as another experiment. Do you dream at night? When you go to sleep at night, do you dream? And what is a dream? To which you respond, well, it's like a motion picture that I see when I sleep. Who sees it? You? 
you see the picture is the same you that dreams the dreams and sees the dreams the same you that looks in the mirror and if so how do you know it's you you're experiencing these things but who's experiencing them that's the question I want to get to see we're not this these are just experiences that we have and things that happen to us but who is it happening to and who is having these experiences is it the same you that's having all these experiences are you the same person who looks in the mirror who sees what you see are you the same person that sees the dreams that you see are you the same person that's listening to these words right now and answering these questions now if you answer correctly if you really think about this and you give an honest answer the conclusion that you're going to come to is it's me it's me I'm the one in here looking out at all of this seeing all this and experiencing all these experiences and guess what you'd be right that's the closest answer you're gonna get it's you but who it, who are you so maybe it, you're your emotions so let's do another experiment let's say that you're standing out with and playing with a dog who's running around in front of you but at that very moment you hear something behind you that sounds like a snake now, are you still going to be focusing on this dog in front of you? Or are you going to be focusing on the fear that you feel about this noise that's behind you? Because the dog is still out in front of you, but now you're, now you're focusing in on this fear. But are you your fear, or is that something that you're feeling? See, we are not the things that we see. It's obvious to see in this world that we're not the things that we look at. It's a simple subject and object uh, relationship. You're the subject and what you're seeing is objects. And it's the same thing with emotions. When you feel fear or joy or love, haven't you felt so much love before that you can't even feel anything else? It takes over your whole entire being because that's what you are focusing on. Fear is the object. You are the subject. You are the one feeling the things that you feel. You are the one seeing the things that you see, but you're not what you see and you're not what you feel. You're the one that's experiencing that. You're the one inside of you that feels these things. So we know that we're not the objects that we see, and we know we're not the emotions that we feel. These are things that we experience, but it's not who we are. So what's next? Maybe we could find you in your thoughts, right? Rene Descartes, who was a very famous philosopher, once said, I think, therefore I am. But is that true? So let me give you a definition of what, think, what it says thinking is right out of the uh, dictionary. It says to think is to form thoughts, to use the mind to consider ideas and make judgments. Well, who is using the mind to consider ideas and make judgments? Isn't it you? You're the one thinking the thoughts, but you aren't the thoughts that you think. The thoughts are what you experience. How about this? People that go into deep, deep meditation, like Zen meditation, the whole point of what they do is they clear their mind. They actually have no thoughts whatsoever. And when they, and they find this peaceful place, and when they come out of that peaceful place, they'll, they'll actually say, wow, that was amazing. I completely cleared my mind. I had no thoughts whatsoever. But who knew they didn't have thoughts? How did they feel? Who felt that peace? So that proves that you're not the thoughts that you think. That's just another object, and you're still the subject. See, if you can be in there realizing you're not thinking, then you're not your thoughts. So we know that we're not the objects that we see, we're not the emotions that we feel, and we're not the thoughts that we think. We're the one experiencing all those thoughts. Who sees when we see? Who hears when we hear? And once again, you're going to come back to the answer, it's me, and you'll be right. See, if you go deep enough inside, if you take a journey deep enough inside and you realize I'm just the person who is experiencing all of these outer forces, inner forces, emotions, and thoughts, but the real me is deep down inside of here. And there's a word for that real you. And God spoke about it right in here. It's called your spirit. See, when your spirit leaves this shell, People can look at that empty shell and know there's no life in there anymore. The shell is still here. The life has moved on. So we've all heard this, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, right? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust means the dust that you came from, your body, will one day return to the dust that it came from, the earth. But if your body that came from the earth returns to the earth, doesn't it make sense that your spirit that came from God will return to the God it came from? 
And that's what I want to talk about next because that's what's really happening. And if we want to take it into a, a more modern explanation, just think about it like this. Your body is the hardware. Your spirit is the software, okay? So if I had an old computer from back in the day and I was running software on it, if you look at that screen on that computer, it's gonna come up in black and white and it's not gonna look half as good as if you can take that same software off of that old computer and put it into a new computer and all of a sudden that software is gonna come up in color. You're gonna see things about it that you never saw because you can remove the software from the hardware and put it into something new and it becomes something new and you'll see it like you've never seen it before. So that's the next thing I wanna talk about is, and this is I know a problem people have, well, okay, where does my spirit go? Where does it go? It goes back to the God that created it. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. All right, so as we just spoke about, crazy enough, we're not three things. We're not our thoughts, we're not our emotions, and we're not the objects that we see, but we are three things. We're spirit, we're matter, and we're flesh. Those are the three things that we are. So, God created us as a spirit. And I wanna read what it says right here in John because we were created by a spirit to worship in the spirit. And eventually that's how we're all gonna end up worshiping. We worship as a spirit in flesh right now, just like Jesus when he came back, he was a spirit in the flesh so that he could walk amongst us. And this is how we walk amongst each other as spirits in the flesh. We have a soul deep down inside of us. This is just a cage. And I wanna show you what it says in John 4, it says this. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. See, he lays it down for you right here. People that say that this is all that you are, that you're just a body, you're just a person that's living and then when this thing goes, we go. God's telling you right here, this is never all that you were. This is just what, this is the cage he's using to hold that life force inside of you. And so watch what he says in Romans. And, and this might be the heaviest one of all. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is in enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you now if any man have not the spirit of Christ he is none of this and if Christ be in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you therefore brethren we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh for if ye live after the flesh ye shall die but if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that awesome? See, it tells you right here that if you just believe that this is all you are, that you're just flesh, and you live your carnal life, meaning everything you do is based on the world and what the world says and who the world is, and not the God that created you and who God says you are and how God says to live, do you live to honor the world or do you live to honor your God? See, in spirit, we honor the Lord. And people understand this. You know why? When you're feeling down, when, you, when you're feeling out, you know what people ask you? Hey, man, why are your spirits down? Well, they don't ask you, why is your flesh down? Right? They can see it. They can experience it. They can feel it. And in the same regard, when you meet somebody and then you're like, wow. Man, that person has a great spirit. When they're happy all the time and they're bringing God with them everywhere they go, people will want to be around that person. A fleshly person, people don't want to be around that person. If you're carnal, you will drive people away. If you are godly, you will draw people to you. And that has nothing to do with your flesh 
and everything to do with your spirit. You know why? Because your spirit is who you really are. People see beyond this. Have you ever heard beauty is skin deep? <laughs> you know why people say that? Because once they get past this outer shell, sometimes what's inside that spirit is dark and people can sense it. And they're like, man, that, that girl is beautiful on the outside, but man, she is a dark storm on the inside, brother. Be careful, beware. And that's what they'll say. Stay away from her. She, her, her spirit's off, man. But once again, if you see somebody who is on the outside, you know, people might say attractive or unattractive, because that's how we judge people by our flesh. But then you get to know that person and you just want to be around them. And people say, well, why do you want to be around that girl, man? You've been with way prettier girls than her. And you look right at them and go, yeah, man, but there's just something about her. She's beautiful inside. She's beautiful inside and it comes through. So y'all can get stuck on this, but I see people like God sees people the heart. It's what's inside that matters, not what's outside. So if that's the case, what I want to talk about next is really important. And that is, how do you know your spirit goes back to God? I mean, what does that mean to go back to God? I mean, all I see is myself right here. I, maybe you're right. Maybe you are a spirit. But how does that spirit get back to, to heaven? If that isn't a, is that really even a place? So we're going to talk about that next. And I'm going to show you right inside of here where it tells you exactly how that happens. And then I'm gonna give you examples of things you can see around here that proves that that's correct. All right, so here we go, man. You're saying to yourself, look, I'm, I'm starting to feel this thing about the spirit, man. I think you might be onto something here because I, I know that I have my ups and downs and I know that it's me that's looking out at everything, that I am the one that's experiencing all this. I'm, I'm that, that existence that, that lives inside of this shell. But this heaven thing, man, like, I'm not sure about this, man. So, so make this make sense to me. So that's what I'm getting ready to do. But I'm not going to do it because I don't qualify to give that. I'm going to let the Lord's book, the instruction manual on life. That's what this really is. I'm going to let that speak to you. So listen to what Paul says. This one comes out of 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You heard that, right? This can't inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, literally says this cannot inherit heaven. See, you can't take something that's corrupt, which we're born into a corrupt world. We're sinners the minute that we hit this place. So you can't take something that's corrupt into a place that is incorrupt. You can't take a mortal body into an immortal heaven. But here's what you can do. When your body returns <laughs> to this earth, to this corrupt earth from which it came, your spirit will return to the incorrupt God from which it came. And you're saying to yourself, man, I hope that's true. <laughs> and it is. And I can show you some things right around here in nature, in your world that you see every day. Because you're saying to yourself, man, but all I see is this. This is what I see. Are you sure when this goes away that something new happens? It says that we have to take off the immortal. I mean, we have to take off the mortal to put on the immortal. What does that mean? Well, let me tell you exactly what it means. See, there's things that crawl around this little world that we're living in called caterpillars. And the whole entire time they're crawling around here, you see them and they're this little tiny worm that's crawling around and they're bound to the ground. That's who they are and that's what they do. But there comes a point in that caterpillar's life where it goes into a cocoon. 
Now, if you saw that caterpillar in that cocoon, you'd be like, that thing's dead, man. There's nothing alive in there. Look at that. That's just, it's, it's a mass of, of it, it's death. It lived, it crawled around, and then it died. That's it. Look, I can look at it and see. But if you watch, eventually that cocoon breaks open. And you know what comes out of that cocoon? A whole new creation. It started off as one thing. It went into a deep sleep and came out as another thing. And here's the kicker. When it was here in one form, all it could do was crawl around in one way. It could never ever do anything else but stay in the existence that it was in. But when it comes out of that cocoon, it can fly. It has a whole new body. It literally changed its mortal to its immortal. That's what it did because no one has to teach a butterfly how to fly. <laughs> when it comes out of that cocoon, it just flaps its wings and off it goes. A whole different experience in a whole different body. And that's exactly what's gonna to happen to you and I. God shows us all the time these kind of things. We just get so caught up in what we do see that we don't see what we can't, that's right in front of us, it's right there. Something as simple as that. But that's just God showing you, hey, this is real. This can actually happen. And when you say to yourself, I don't know, man, when this body goes down, that's it. No, when this body goes up, you sprout wings, brother. You fly. And no one has to tell you or teach you. You just go back to from whence you came. So you can say to yourself, yeah, but dude, they bury us in the ground, man. They put us in the ground. Okay, that's cool. Let's talk about that. There's a, when you see a, there's a flower called a gladiola. And it starts off as a bowl. And it's ugly. <laughs> it just looks like a rock, basically, like a little black rock. But if you take that little black rock and you place that thing and you bury it in the ground and cover it with dirt and you just look at it, you're like, all right, there's death. I see you. That, that. I mean, what's the difference between being buried and being planted, right? What's the difference? Well, I'm about to tell you the difference because buried means there's nothing there. But when you're planted, something good always comes out of what's planted, right? So you take that little bulb and you place it under the ground and you cover it with dirt. And then you water it as the Lord himself waters our soul. And within a few months from this little bulb, this little rock looking thing that you buried in the ground, up out of that ground comes one of the most colorful, most beautiful flowers that you have ever seen. It grows into a whole new creation, which looks nothing like the thing that was planted. Not at all. It's, it's so much more beautiful than what was placed in the ground. And that's who you and I are. It's all around us, everybody. God will show you these things over and over again if you just look. Think about this. God shows us seasons, right? He shows us seasons. Do you think it's a coincidence that winter, which is always signifies decay, death, cold, bitterness. Do you know what season follows directly after winter, the, the season of death? Spring, spring, after death comes new life. <laughs> and without that death, without those things dying, new life could not come up from that. Do you see how he shows us in every single thing? It's all around us, everybody. One must happen to achieve the other. That's what this world is. It's getting ready for the next world. Just like when you were in your mother's womb. When you were in your mother's womb, you had eyes. You developed eyes, but you couldn't see. You developed a mouth, but you weren't eating. You had hands and feet, but you weren't walking. But you know what you were getting ready for? The next thing, the next version of life that was coming. Because if God knew when you came out, when you became that new creation that's living in a new existence, you were gonna need your eyes and your mouth and your hands and your feet. He shows us all the time. So when we go down, and this will one day go back to the earth from whence it came, I promise you this, your spirit will return to the God which breathed that life into you in the first place. Life doesn't die. Your spirit has no mass and no weight. Things that have no mass and no weight don't die. It's the things that have mass and weight that go away. The spirit goes back. And that's what I want to get across to you today. You are not your flesh. You are not the things that you see. You are not the emotions that you feel, and you are not the thoughts that you think. You're the one, the spirit inside of that, who is experiencing the emotions, who is seeing the objects, who is thinking the thoughts. That's who you are, 
And just like when you were 10 and you looked in the mirror and you saw the 10 year old you, and now you're 35 and you're looking in the mirror and you see the 35 year old you, and you'll hear people say, yeah, but I still feel like I'm, I'm 15, 16 years old, man. You'll see a 40 year old man say, yeah, but I still feel like I'm 20. What's he saying? What you see on the outside isn't what I feel on the inside. Because who you are is within you. And that thing within you will always go back to where it came. Life, eternity, immortality in heaven with the God who created you. I appreciate y'all coming out and listening and watching. And I hope that you understand what an amazing creation you are. And what an amazing creator that we have. And the God who sent us here will call us home one day. And if you believe, if you speak with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will spend eternity with him. I promise you. God bless. So thank you so much for joining us today. Just a quick wrap up of the things that we spoke about is this. Who are you? Who sees when you see? Who hears when you hear? Who experiences the things you experience? It's not the things you see, it's not the thoughts that you think, and it's not the emotions that you feel. You are the spirit that God placed inside of you. And as long as you remember that, your spirit is immortal. It will live one day with our Father in heaven. And our point was made today. I just wanted to show everybody, this is the most important relationship you will ever have. And it started before you were even formed in your mother's womb. God placed a spirit in you and brought you to this existence for a reason. And it's a choice. He wants you to choose him. And when you choose him, you never ever are let go. He's got you in the palm of his hand. He tells you this. Jesus says, I have you in the palm of my hand. And no one can ever take you away from that. No man. And then it says right after that, that God has you in the palm of his hand and no man can take you from that. And I picture those hands just like this. One and the other, you can't get out. Not even you can take you from out of God's hands. So remember that. Go to the safest place you know. Let your spirit return from the place that it came from. Go to Jesus. Choose Jesus. Stay with Jesus. And one day, you will be at the right hand of your father, just like he's at the right hand of his. I love each and every one of you. I pray for each and every one of you. And I say to you this day, God bless and amen. Love you guys.